20 minutes late now. Our next speaker is a freelance writer who writes a science blog for Forbes Media called Progressive Download. He's written for many publications, and he's an author of a biography of Lemaitre. He's going to tell us about Lemaitre. John Farrell. Can you hear me if I'm this far on the mic? Speaking loud. Uh, no, speaking loud. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So this is um, a personal profile of Lemaitre, uh, just because I thought that would be uh, uh, a little departure from all the... Uh, of the science. Um, sometimes referred to as father of the Big Bang, and sometimes less politely as the Big Bang Man, uh, Georges Lemaitre was born on July 14, 1894, in the Belgian town of Charleroi. By the way, I'm going to apologize in advance for how I mangle uh, French. Ich habe Deutsch studiert aus dem Nazi. Uh, Charleroi, as I understand, was a comparatively recent home for the Lemaitre family, which had its roots in Courcelles to the west. Um, Lemaitre's worked uh, with the hands that were weavers, and known as coal miners, and Lemaitre's great-grandfather, Clement, had served in Napoleon's 112th line. Uh, according to family history, he was twice wounded. Uh, his father, Joseph, was born in 1867, and he came from the first generation of the Lemaitre's uh, uh, to complete a university education. Uh, in 1893, uh, when he was 26, he married Marguerite de Lannoy, and they started a family, ultimately raising four sons. Uh, Lemet was the oldest. Uh, Joseph studied law, and although he became an accredited lawyer, he didn't practice at first. He formed his own business uh, and invented a new procedure to stretch glass. I'm not exactly sure what that means. I'm not being technical, but uh, it, it's a, a model that uh, would prefigure the later methods employed to this day by the European Glaberbell Glassware Company. Uh, however, just to really quickly, uh, uh, the factory burned down and he ended up working as a lawyer uh, in Brussels uh, for the bank. Uh, at age 10 in 1904, uh, Lemaitre entered the Jesuit High School of the Sacred Heart in Charleroi. Uh, over the six years he spent there, he distinguished himself in mathematics and during his last two years in physics and chemistry. He then went on to uh, Jesuit prep school in Brussels, uh, the College of St. Miguel in 1910 to study mathematics for the entrance exam to the College of Engineering in Spain. He was actually intending to be an engineer. Uh, of his many teachers from this period, one father, Pete Ernest Baru, uh, stands out, not only because he represented a role model for the young Lemaitre as a priest and a scientist, um, but also because of his thoughtfulness regarding the boundaries that separated theology and science, a subject uh, that would remain central to Lemaitre's thinking throughout his life. Uh, Lemaitre recalled uh, one occasion from the classroom when Baru gave him pause uh, after Lemaitre expressed himself excitedly in a particular passage from the book of Genesis that seemed to suggest a foreshadowing of developments in science. Uh, the older priest held him to uh, curb his enthusiasm. If there is a connection, Baru said, it's a coincidence and of no importance, and if you should prove to me that it exists, I would consider it unfortunate. It will merely encourage more thoughtless people to imagine that the Bible teaches infallible science, whereas the most we can say is that occasionally one of the prophets made the correct scientific guess. Okay. Uh, as most of our friends here from Europe can tell, in this country we are surrounded by people who do this all the time. <laughs> um, in August of 1914, Lemaitre and his younger brother Jacques were planning a cycling tour of Tyrol uh, when uh, the war started. Uh, the Reich armies marched into Belgium that very month. Uh, the two brothers enlisted on the 9th of August in the Belgian 5th Corps Volunteers. After receiving some basic instruction, uh, they were shipped to one of the six divisions of the Belgian 3rd Army. Uh, and uh, uh, by October 18th, Lamette was in the midst of the Battle of the East Sea. He saw quite a bit of carnage, actually. And uh, Odon Godard uh, speculated that some of what he saw and lived through was what inspired him to become a priest, although it's also uh, fairly well known that he knew even earlier than that. Told his parents he wanted to be a priest supposedly when he was nine years old. But it's quite possible that what he lived through just uh, uh, made it more solid for him. Uh, he was eventually transferred out of the infantry, infantry to an artillery division, and according to family legend, he incurred the wrath of one, of one instructor when he had the gall to point out an error he discovered in the ballistics manual in the army. So by the end of the war, his brother Jacques attained a commission as a lieutenant, while his older brother had to content himself with remaining a sergeant. Perhaps, as he half seriously told the journalists later on, because of, quote, bad character, unquote. For all that, he did receive uh, the Croix de Gueux for bravery. Uh, his first step to finish a PhD was in 1919, Catholic University 
the bank, when he passed the supplementary exams to become a candidate in physical and mathematical sciences. Uh, he obtained his PhD, summa cum laude, in 1920, along with a baccalaureate in Thomas philosophy. Uh, at the same time, he decided on his vocation and entered the house of St. Rombeau as a seminarian in October of 1920. Uh, Rombeau was an extension of the main seminary for the Archdiocese of Malines under the bishopric of Cardinal Mercier, who would become one of his uh, mentors and sponsors. Mercier is an interesting character. There's not a lot I know about him, but apparently he was the one who really spearheaded for Pope Leo the revival of Aquinas, the teaching of Aquinas and uh, Thomas philosophy, because uh, Pope Leo, coming after Pope Pius IX, thought it would be a good idea to inject uh, more science into Catholic education. Someone like him again. Um, in 1922, uh, Lamette wrote his own short thesis, The Physics of Einstein, which he entered in a competition for scholarship from the Belgian government to study abroad. Uh, he won the scholarship, which allowed him to travel across the channel to the UK for a year of study uh, and to meet the man whose books on Einstein physics had opened up a new world uh, for him, and that was uh, Sir Roger Stanley Eddington. Um, and by the way, one of the myths about Lamette is that he's a Jesuit. Uh, uh, he was just a standard diocesan priest. That's just a, a shot of, uh, with the family after his first mass. Um, under Eddington's supervision, uh, he planned in the 1923-1924 academic year to write a paper on the concept of simultaneity and general relativity, how it must be modified when shifting from objects accelerating in a straight path to objects accelerating in curved space. Uh, and for the very next year, he went to Harvard, uh, also MIT. He was kind of odd. He was going, shuttling back and forth between Harvard and MIT. He did two more doctorates. Um, with a new scholarship from the CRB, uh, the Educational Foundation, funded by the Committee in Relief of Belgium, he planned to meet and study with some of Eddington's American colleagues, chiefly those who specialized in the direct observations of stars and nebulae, with some of the world's best equipment, Carla Shapley, uh, who was late at the Mount Wilson Observatory and director of Harvard College Observatory from 1920 until 1952. He welcomed Lamette for the academic year of 1924-25. So it's interesting is he was already, I think, thinking about looking for uh, hard data uh, for, uh, to uh, add evidence to an expanding universe model or some kind of dynamic model. In the summer of 24, when he came to Harvard, Shapley suggested that he study the theory of variable stars once he was familiar with their observations, and this entailed spending much of September of the academic year at the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa, Canada. He spent a lot of time between 1923 and 1926 on trains. Uh, this also entailed special tutoring on the subject of set of variables from a fellow countryman. Uh, and at Harvard, Lament took courses in experimental spectroscopy, as well as courses on interference problems in spectro uh, spectroscopy. Just added, thanks to the uh, Lowell Archives. Uh, this is a postcard that Lament sent to Slifer on his way by train to the Lowell Observatory, June 21st. Um, I can't read it. But basically it says, Dear Sir, I'll be uh, I'll call upon you Tuesday. Uh, and I don't think he stayed long. Is he I don't know, it would be interesting to find out how long he stayed at Lowell, whether it's one day, two days, but then you know, back on the train to Chicago. As we know, uh, he also traveled to Mount Wilson, met with Hubble in 1925, and then went back to um, Louvain, where he became an assistant professor. Um, Harry Nussbaum talked about this excellently, so I won't dwell too much on his first paper in 1925 noted the Sitter's universe, except what fascinated me when I, I found out that Alan Guth said Lamech's paper on the Sitter was what first gave him the inspiration for the inflationary, his inflationary uh, theory, which I thought was uh, fascinating. Uh, and then his 1927 paper, um, which again has been discussed. Um, when he finished this paper, he made the curious decision to submit it to an obscure Belgian journal, the Annals des Societés Scientifiques de Bruxelles, rather than one of the more widely read journals like the Zeitschrift, as Friedman did. Neither apparently did he consider sending it to Eddington for possible publication in the monthly notices. Now, there's been all sorts of speculation about, like, why did he do it? Why did he put it in this obscure journal? And um, uh, I have to say, I'm not satisfied with the, the general, what I've read is that, well, he was just kind of, you know, very modest. He didn't want to draw any attention. But after all that mileage he racked up, going all over the US and Canada to get all this data, it hardly seems to make sense. Um, one theory I had, with, I, which I mentioned in Cormac, was that uh, he, figured he, should, he, he knew the importance of what he was doing and he wanted to publish it in the Belgian <coughs> journal, that's somewhat nationalistic. 
the other idea was that I think he wanted to publish it as quickly as possible so that he could send copies to Eddington and, uh, and Einstein or show it to whatever. Uh, that's just my theory. I have not the slightest evidence to support that. It's just that I, I find it uh, hard to believe that he, did, he just buried it there because he was shy and retiring and didn't want to draw any attention to himself. <coughs> As we know, uh, the initial meeting with Einstein at Solvay, your calculations are correct, but your physics is abominable, which is pretty much exactly what he said to Friedman. Uh, he is said to, oh, this, okay, then we jump ahead to 1930 when Hubble had published his findings and Einstein and Sitter and uh, Eddington decided we have to do something, we have to decide which of the models, the Sitter model or the Einstein model is going to be it. And he said to have quipped at the time, well, shall we put a little motion into Einstein's universe or shall we put a little matter into the Sitter's? <laughs> Uh, the notes from the proceedings were published a few months later when Lament read them in Belgium. He immediately sent his former mentor a message along with another copy of his paper telling him that he had, in fact, already solved this problem. Uh, this is George McVitty, who uh, later recalled, I well remember the day when Eddington rather shamefacedly showed me a letter from Lament which reminded him of the solution to the problem which Lament had already given. Eddington confessed that, though he'd seen the paper, he completely forgot about it until that moment. So the oversight was quickly remedied by Eddington's letter to Nature of 1930, uh, in which he drew attention to Lamette's uh, work of three years before. Uh, notwithstanding Einstein's dismissal of the cosmological constant, he was impressed with Lamette's expanding model once the observational data became widely known, and Eddington publicized Lamette's solution. Uh, he, in fact, cited Lamette's and Tolman's solutions when visited Caltech, I think in 1932. Uh, like to Sitter and many of his colleagues, he embraced Lamette's theory in light of the new data. He published, I'm not talking about the primeval atom, I'm just talking about the expanding model system, that's clear. He publi publicly accepted the new paradigm of expansion in April 1931 in Pasadena and at Mount Wilson, and mentioned Lamette's work in conjunction with Tolman's as being the convincing factor for him. Uh, not long after they met in 1933 in California, he recommended Lament alongside two others for the Belgian Franke Prize from King Leopold III, uh, which next to the Nobel at the time was the most generous then in existence. Uh, so very briefly, um, this is pretty much where I think Lament recedes from the picture because uh, not only because of World War II, uh, his father died in 1942 and he felt more of an obligation to stay close to his mother, to his mother his, his brothers were married, had families. Sitter was gone by this point. Eddington uh, died in the 40s. Uh, and Einstein became more and more preoccupied, as we all know, with his you know, unified field theory. Uh, so at this point, he's really kind of out of the, the history of the Big Bang model, and uh, Gamow and his team would kind of pick it up from here. So uh, to get on to uh, some more interesting uh, uh, interactions, um, in November of 51, Lamette had been invited to Rome at the end of the study week for a solemn audience where Pope Pius XII famously said, this quote, it would seem that, he basically he just said, the Big Bang is evidence of, you know, the yeah, books from the Bible. And um, Father Baru must have been turning in his grave. And Lament, uh, as Erna, the late Erna McMullen pointed out later, uh, it was the one time he saw Lament really, really upset uh, was um, uh, this um, interference out of the Pope's part. Having been appointed to the membership in the Pontifical Academy by Pius's predecessor, because of his standing among cosmologists, he was understandably dismayed as to why he had at least been consulted about the Pope's address before he did that. But within a few months, he and the uh, director of the Vatican Observatory met with the Pope to explain that such blatant connections drawn between science and theology would not help the cause of the church, nor the progress of science. And less than a year later, when the Pope addressed a gathering of uh, astronomers at Castel Gandolfo, he refrained from discussing uh, the metaphysical implications of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, but this is another thing, I think, that kind of further push Lament away from continued interest in working on the Big Bang Theory. Uh, I, he felt really embarrassed by this. And um, as I'm going to show you, while they were friends, uh, and got along well, uh, Hoyle really stuck it to him <laughs> after, the, after the Pope's speech. Uh, and George Gamow had quite a bit of fun with it as well. Um, that said, Lament and Hoyle got along quite well in spite of the differences uh, over theory and their vastly different backgrounds. Uh, this is what I call the surf and turf scene. Hoyle later recollected in 1957, uh, he and I did a two-week drive through Italy in the Alps. We only had one disagreement, and it wasn't over cosmology, it was over food. Uh, it was a Friday, and at dinner that night, I ordered a big steak while George, who befitted his position, ordered fish. When the waiters wait, wait delivered our orders, the steak was good. The fish, on the other hand, was enormous. A prince of a fish, which clearly warranted comment, 
So in all innocence, I said, now at last, George, I see why you are a Catholic. <laughs> at this, George became red-faced and peevish. For a few seconds, I thought the ghost of Mark Luther had tempted me into a serious religio-diplomatic indiscretion. And then in a flash, I realized that he didn't like fish. He desperately wanted my steak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, during the 50s, um, as I said, while well, he retreated from the Big Bang theorizing, he got more and more involved in uh, computing, uh, especially when scientific use of computers on campuses was on the rise. Uh, he lent Louvain's university rector the funds to purchase the campus's first electronic computer, a Burroughs E101. Uh, I'm sure there are probably people here who are really into the history of computers and know exactly what it's like. Uh, in the next decade, his very last years, he upgraded to an IBM and in Elliot, and on these machines, he taught himself assembler languages, busied himself with numerical calculations of problems in celestial mechanics, which he employed, enjoyed uh, handing on to his students. Uh, Vatican II, uh, in 1960, he was made president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and shortly after the death of John XXIII, uh, he was bemused to find himself put on a uh, commission to study uh, birth control. Uh, his question was, I'm a mathematician, what am I doing here? Uh, nevertheless, he did make a kind of modest recommendation for modifying the church's teaching, which uh, was ignored. Uh, in late December 64, he suffered a mild heart attack while he was in Rome. Uh, upon returning to Louvain, he was hospitalized for a short period and put on a strict dietary regimen. Uh, but shortly after, he was diagnosed with a form of leukemia. Uh, he was in the hospital when his colleague, Odin Godard, brought him the news that Pensias and Wilson had detected the uh, CMB. Uh, and he died June 17th, 1966. Um, these are some recent personal recollections I got from Thomas Banchoff, who's now a retired professor of mathematics at Brown. He was at uh, UC Berkeley studying mathematics the last time the man came to the US. Uh, so he told me a little bit about his uh, interactions with him. Uh, he told me he's not a very tall man, probably five feet seven or eight inches in height, but he was rotund, almost like Santa Claus, he said. I drove a Volkswagen in those days, and when we drove to San Francisco, I was worried he wouldn't fit in the car. <laughs> From that picture, you can kind of get a sense of his uh, enormousness. I had numerous conversations with him about his life at Louvain, Bainshaw said, and I was surprised to hear that he had never learned any Flemish, the language of the majority of people in Belgium. He was, in fact, a vocal advocate of French, to the point that his house was once the target of a small bomb thrown in his front door, and he's quite proud of that. This is uh, more into the theological uh, debate, kind of theology and science side. Um, but I was fascinated by this quote from Dirac when I was talking with Lamette about his subject and feeling stimulated by the grandeur of the picture he's given us. I told him I thought cosmology was the branch of science that lies closest to religion, but he did not agree with me. After thinking it over, he suggested psychology is lying closest to religion. Kind of a cryptic. Uh, but then it ties into what Lamech himself said later on when he was pressed for the theological implications of the Big Bang. As far as I can see, such a theory remains entirely outside any metaphysical or religious question. It leaves the materialist free to deny any transcendental being. He may keep for the bottom of space-time the same attitude of mind he has been able to adopt for events occurring in non-singular places. For the believer, it removes any attempt at familiarity with God, as were Laplace's um, flick of the finger or Jean's finger of God. It's consonant with the wording of Isaiah speaking of the hidden God, hidden even in the beginning. Science has not to surrender in face of the universe, and when Pascal tries to infer the existence of God from the supposed infinitude of nature, we may think that he's looking in the wrong direction. I thought not a fascinating thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll close with this quote from Jean Eisenstadt, who's done a lot of work, looked over uh, Lemaitre's papers, in particular uh, the paper Lemaitre wrote on Schwarzschild's uh, solution. Uh, which later uh, uh, inspired Tolman and Oppenheimer, who wrote kind of the first paper on uh, how to model the collapse of a star, basically a black hole. One of the most important characteristics of his approach, I think, is the subtle interplay between local and global concerns in his work, the stars and the cosmos, contracting the other league and the expanding universe, the condensation of a star and the collapse of the universe. In a way, Lemaitre was able to describe the local in the global, stars embedded in the universe, the Schwarzschild solution is described in the same coordinates as Friedman's solution. This tendency to combine the local and the global, the awareness of the parallels between cosmology and the treatment of an individual star, enabled him to view things in new and unexpected ways to look, so to speak, at the Schwarzschild solution, uh, singularity from the interior or at the universe from the exterior. It was this general approach 
and his extraordinary facility in delicately manipulating the equations of the universe that enables Lamet to shake off the dogma of the impenetra impenetrability of the Schwarzschild singularity. I mean, whereas Friedman dies young, uh, Lemaitre, as you say, just disappears from the stage. It's, it's extraordinary. And I don't think the whole thing of the Pope, and I know Gamow's made a bit of a lash and all that, I don't think that's strong enough somehow. And I wonder, you know, could it be a combination of, number one, you know, the primeval atom thing? He, he really endured quite a lot of unfair criticism, you know. Even Einstein, you know, he literally specifically did draw a link with creation, creationism and stuff like that. And that must have, must have hurt, I think. Of all people, that would have really hurt him. You know? And then the second thing is when you combine that with the fact that I think the primeval atom hypothesis was pretty much blown out of the water quite quickly because developments in nuclear physics, you know, that, that happened quite quick. So the combination of those, uh, I mean, it's complete speculation, but you wonder, he, he may never have recovered, you know, he may have felt almost a figure of ridicule or something. That's possible, yeah. And, and Godard, uh, during the 50s, uh, constantly asked and urged him to talk to Gamma, talk to Gamma, you should do. You know, together and you know, ramp up to the next level, uh, but um, uh, uh, for reasons that we don't know. I mean, I, I think we shouldn't uh, forget, overlook the fact that during the war, he really was cut off from everybody for a long time. And I think by habit, even before that, he was kind of used to working on his own and somewhat in isolation. Um, so, but uh, he was notoriously bad at saving his correspondence. So, uh, I think like it's great finding that postcard here that he sent to Slifer, but I'm, you know. Uh, he wasn't so good at saving the uh, things that people sent to him or his own correspondence. Can I, can I say as well, one thing Goddard says somewhere, I can't remember where, and I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. He, he quite respected Hoyle, like a lot of mathematicians. He, he really respected the idea that Hoyle comes up with this idea, yeah, you can have an expanding universe, but it doesn't have to be an evolving one. And he just liked the idea. He didn't agree with it, but he liked the sort of, the, the way he sort of, you know, that, like, that would explain why they wouldn't be in loggerheads, I think. Yes, no, I think professionally they really had a lot of respect for one thing I wanted to say to Ari's point, which uh, uh, coming f uh, for me, uh, uh, just coming to writing this book about Lamet was kind of like accidental. But uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I studied literature. I wasn't a, a science undergrad, but I read lots of science, uh, popular science books in the seventies and eighties, and they always discussed Friedman. They never mentioned Lamet. In fact, they only did mention Lamet. And I'm thinking of popular books like Isaac Asimov, you know, Paul Davies, things like that. Uh, they would mention Lamette as a kind of an afterthought. Oh, he came up with this primeval atom theory that, you know, most people thought was kind of crackpot. And that was all I knew about him until I was actually researching something else and came across Eisenstein's paper. And I thought, wow, this guy had his fingers in a lot of different things. So, uh, uh, that, which I think, I mean, I really enjoyed Ari's presentation. But you know, from my perspective, I, Lamette was a very, very kind of recent. I always thought the, the guy was just kind of a minor character in all of this. He, when I read those, you know, kind of, and again, admittedly, these are popular you know, books for the popular audience. It was always Friedman, Hubble, you know, Einstein. They almost never discussed Lament as kind of, this, except this guy who's kind of in the background, you know, arguing for a primeval atom theory. So I had no idea that, you know, he wrote that paper in 1927 or the Note and Desider and stuff like that. So I think even Lament's kind of revival has been very, very recent. But anyway, that's. Well, if I just add to that, it seems to me that the matro has been kind of recovered since maybe around about 1980 when there was the book, the Eddie's report by Berger. And then Helga Kral started to go into the matro papers and really did a very important job working through the matro material starting in the late 1980s and kind of continues on in a way with that research. And so I think that was really. Right, and then the, the first really comprehensive biography, Dominique Van Veres, was only 2000, which is just very relatively recent. Yeah, <coughs> <coughs>